All right, welcome everyone to Six Ways an LED Floodlight System Leads to Success. My name is Stephen Major. I'm a product manager at ADB Airfield Solutions. So quickly to go through the agenda, today we're going to start by looking at um, some of the features that provide energy savings, um, including highlighting the precision, precision lighting feature of the F32 floodlight, also looking at electrical consumption. Then we'll look at maintenance cost savings, what features of the floodlight system um, provide savings. Then we're going to look at safety and security advantages. Uh, this system in particular uh, has a lot of these. And then there are other advantages that um, are unique to certain airports, so we'll highlight some of those. Uh, then we'll get into a, a product overview, look at the electrical and mechanical, mechanical details look at uh, the lighting module unit, which is part of the maintenance savings, the modularity of this system, uh, and then also discuss how to proceed with installation. And then we're going to take a look at the different design tools that are available, um, including uh, a tool called, called Dialux for lighting calculations, um, an ROI analysis, and also ADB suggested specifications for this unit. The LED apron lighting solution, the F32 unit, has a concept called precise illumination, which means you're lighting only the areas you need to. Typically, uh, this is in terms of ICAO and recently RP37-15. Uh, for the apron, that's going to be 20 lux. And uh, the precise illumination uh, means you're going to be saving energy because you're not spilling over into other areas that you don't need lit. Also, advanced dimming. Um, if you take the, the F system into um, a more controlled way of doing things, you can dim down to 10%. Um, according to FAA, or ICAO and RP37, though, apron areas that aren't in use are typically dimmed down to 50% of the lux value, so dimming down from 20 to 10 lux. And there are additional savings in electrical consumption. Um, you'll see in a side-by-side -side comparison of conventional lighting um, and even other LED competitors that we're facing that our electrical consumption is much less. And we'll look at a case study that provides an example. So uh, this is an example in Innsbruck Airport, Austria. This red line um, shows the area of the apron that the customer wanted lit. And you'll notice that well, we have a taxiway and a service road um, that are adjacent to this apron. So here's the after. Uh, you can see there are sharp cutoff points um, to the area being illuminated. So we're getting these precise lighting boundaries. Um, a benefit of this, um, not only for energy savings, there's no glare on adjacent taxiways. This is important for pilots that are taxiing in from the runway. Also, you can see that there's no light above 90 degrees, um, otherwise known as an upward light ratio of 0.0%. Uh, so this is really good, especially if you have an air traffic control tower um, nearby that needs to keep an eye out um, on aircraft that are entering the area. So conventional lighting wastes light. Here we indicate that in red. Uh, we have light going above the 90 uh, degree line. Um, and this also results in light pollution and glare that we discussed earlier. So with precise LED optics, um, we're minimizing environmental impact. We're not illuminating areas, providing glare to areas around the airport that don't need to be lit. So here's an example looking at uh, an airport from a distance, uh, metal halide quartz. You can see that the um, light pollution is pretty intense versus the EO LED floodlights that, that we sell. Um, so if you look at the before and after pictures, you can really see the benefits um, that this picture provides with a upper light ratio of zero and reduced glare. So another instance where this could come in handy is a corner aircraft stand. Conventional lighting will overflow and waste light on perimeter roads or taxiways that aren't supposed to be lit, and this can cause some glare and confusion. With the ADB's apron flood lighting solution, you can light the exact area that you want to light. Notice there is no 
overflow of light uh, on the service road or taxiway. So with dimming, I mentioned earlier that ICAO specifies um, acceptable visibility conditions um, where services aren't taking place. Uh, you can drop the illumination by 50% the average level uh, at the aircraft stand. So another nice feature of ADB's LED floodlight is its dim dimming capability. Um, for enhanced control of apron floodlight, you can either implement uh, a dolly in interface or a 1 to 10 volt uh, control of individual lighting units. And what this does is give you the opportunity to further reduce energy consumption by up to 25%. So here in this example of dimming, we have all of our gates illuminated at 100% or 20 lux. When the gates aren't in service, we can dim them down to 50% of the output value or 10 lux. An aircraft is coming in, we want to utilize gate 2 for service. We increase the light level to 100% while leaving the other gates at the 50% value. This also improves guidance for the approaching aircraft because it knows exactly which gate it has to pull into. So with conventional lighting, dimming to 50% isn't possible. Now, conventional lighting, I mean metal halides or high pressure sodium. So with conventional lighting, if you turn off the apron lights, you'll get you'll lose lighting on three out of four gates. So you're not meeting um, ICAO standards or uh, recommended practice standards with conventional lighting. So when looking at energy savings, we're going to look at uh, the Munich International Airport. Uh, here's an example of the um, the pole carrier and F32 lights at that airport. So this airport has seven high mass systems, and they want to be compliant to ICAO Annex 14. They have a illuminance of around 30 lux, and they want to have uh, increased control over their lighting. So they want to control using a dolly interface, uh, constant light output or CLO. So they're adjusting the light, they're adjusting the Miller amperage uh, drive current. Um, over time to make sure that they have constant light output. And then they're also automatically lowering nighttime lighting to 50%. So before, uh, they were using high pressure sodium lamps and the total power consumption was 100, around 148 kilowatts. After um, implementing the LED system, uh, they were able to drop their power consumption at around 60 kilowatts which yielded savings of nearly 60% um, or approximately $83,000 a year. So now let's look at different ways maintenance can uh, benefit from these lights. So the service life of the LED solution is more than 50,000 hours. Um, it has a simple design and fewer spare parts. You can see here on the picture on the right, you have drivers, uh, terminal block, a surge protector, and then a component mounting plate. So uh, there are important things to note here on this light source comparison. Um, first we have light color. This is important when it comes to color rendering index or CRI. Uh, we'll talk more about this later. And then life cycle. If you notice, there's a dramatic difference between the LED and the metal halide and high pressure sodium. We're almost going up by 10 times the life cycle using an LED. Also notice that dimming with a high pressure sodium, you can only bring it down to 80%. And then with a metal halide quartz, it's not even possible. So LED apron lighting systems are designed for the environment they're going to be installed in. We can plug in the high and low temperature averages to determine an appropriate drive current for the location. Everyone knows that heat degrades the life of an LED, so we aren't going to recommend a drive current of 700 milliamps for an airport in Nevada. Notice how long the life of an LED is extended with a drive current of 350 milliamps. This is exactly what we did uh, with Henderson Executive Airport in Nevada to ensure the longevity of the LEDs. The trade-off for driving at a lower current is that you may need more lights for certain applications.
So here's a close-up look um, at the F32. It's a, a simple design. There are 32 lens units and 16 six LED boards making up the LED modules. There are four drivers. Each driver controls one quadrant of the LED modules. Since we can control each driver for dimming purposes, this gives us the advanced control to dim individual gates, which we showed in the previous example. A question that often comes up is, am I going to have to replace the whole light or can I replace individual LED modules? This is a good question because LEDs will eventually fail at different times. With this unit, you can replace individual modules easily by using quick disconnects to unplug the Foley LED board and replace it with a spare. There's also the option to stock one or more spare component plates. So you have the additional option to unscrew an entire panel, re-terminate three to five wires, and troubleshoot electronics of faulty plate in the shop. So when I say three to five wires, if you're uh, simply powering on and off the units, uh, it'll be three wires. If you're using one to 10 volt or dollar control, you'll be running five wires. So now looking at the safety and security benefits. First of all, um, high color rendering index. Um, we're providing a, a cool white color temperature, which uh, we'll see in the next slides creates a uniform color. Multi-layer lighting. As far as I know, no other competitor in this industry is doing this multi-layer lighting concept. So we'll show that. And also improved uniformity of apron lighting. So the IKO minimum for this is 0.25, and this is also recommended by uh, IES RP37-15. Also, LEDs versus high-pressure sodium or metal halide offer instant hot restart of less than a second. This diagram shows the color accuracy provided by different levels um, of the color rendering index. So this first um, scale, 50 to 70 CRI, uh, you can see that the picture it seem, appears gray. It's, it's difficult to determine um, the accurate colors. And so the 50 to 70 would be your uh, white fluorescent, your high pressure sodium, and metal halide. And then we improve our CRI to 70 to 80 um, when we get into the spectrum of triphosphor fluorescent. And as far as I know, this, this type of um, technology isn't used with apron floodlighting. Then we move up to the best, or 80 to 90 CRI, um, which is this white LED, or 5700K color. So the benefits of having this increased uh, color perception is uh, reading luggage tags, you can determine apron painted lines and markings, uh, notice colors better, uh, security badge identifications, and even people recognition and color clothing. So if you're using a, a visual surveillance uh, system at the airport, when you have a high color rendering index, you're going to be able to identify things on that apron uh, more easily. So high pressure sodium. Uh, on the left produces an orange glow, distorting the actual colors. And you can see the LED floodlighting on the right, with the higher color rendering index. Now on the front of the plane, you'll notice here that on the left with the LED floodlighting, you can clearly see the color of the stripe on the plane. And you can see the colors and even read the letters very easily on the catering truck in the background. This Kelvin color temperature scale shows where typical lights fall. You can see that HPS and metal halide lights fall in the yellow warmer color temperatures. We use a standard cool white color temperature of 5700K, but we can also do 4000K and 3000K depending on the requirements of the airport. But this cool white 5700K um, has been uh, by far the most um, popular option. So here's your high pressure sodium warm white color temperature with a CRI of 25 and you're trying to figure out what the tail color is. It's difficult to determine in this picture. Then on the other side of the plane, we have the LED flow light with a cool white color temperature of 5700K, and we can clearly see the colors on the aircraft. So a concept that our LED light uses that no other light can do is multi-layering. Since we have 32 light modules in the F32, and each one overlaps some light on the same surface area, the combination of the illumination provided by each individual module creates a total illumination on the surface area. 
So how does this come into play? Uh, with conventional floodlights, um, if one light goes out, you're left with an area um, that has a dark spot. Uh, and that presents security uh, and safety risks. With the LED floodlights, you can notice that each light is overlapping the illumination provided by another. So if one of these lights goes out, we're still maintaining illumination in the entire area, maintaining uh, uniformity. So here's an actual example of uniformity. The uniformity ratio refers to the evenness of distribution of light on a surface. It compares the minimum illuminance to the average illuminance. In a job in South Africa, we were up against other competitors for an Abram project. The airport decided that they wanted two lighting calculations, one with all the floodlights on and one with 50% of the floodlights off to see the uniformity of 0.25 was maintained. Notice that the average lux drops from 23 to 12, so we're still within the 50% um, levels specified by ICAO and RP37, but the uniformity remains above 0.25. The other co competitors couldn't do this with their spotlight type LEDs, um, and uh, we eventually ended up winning the project. So and here, here's an example of a false color, color rendering um, that it's provided in lighting calculations uh, that also shows um, the lux levels and uniformity. But each color in this false color rendering represents a different illuminance in, in lux. So I'm guessing a lot of people remember the Super Bowl blackout in 2012 um, with the metal halide lights. These lights weren't equipped with ballast necessary for hot restrike because we had to wait, I don't know how, how many minutes for the lights to come back up to intensity. So this is the restrike time. High pressure sodium and metal halide can do this with a special module, uh, but you'll notice that with uh, LED, we don't require any special instant restrike option, and we're coming on in less than a second to full intensity. So some other advantages, some of these may be unique um, to certain airports. This first view, if you're interested in control and monitoring of your airfield lighting, um, knowing that it's easy to interface to an ALCMS or ramp management system might be a really good advantage for your airport. Also, less frequent maintenance means higher availability of aircraft parking spaces, um, especially as traffic continues to increase um, at an exponential level, uh, this becomes more and more important. And some non-tangible advantages, the F-32 floodlight is a green, gives the airport a green modern image, um, and then there's also environmental advantages because of the lack of light pollution on surrounding communities or habitat. So for example, one airport had uh, was located near a beach and um, one to protect a, uh, a colony of, of sea turtles. So that would be one option for them. So now um, getting into a product overview of the F32 unit. Uh, the dimensions are important to take into consideration when figuring the effective projected area, or EPA. And this is used to determine the wind load and necessary strength of the carrier mass system on which lighting will be mounted. The F32 has the smallest EPA compared to the competition. Uh, the housing is made of high-grade aluminum die cast, um, and there is an optional powder coating for areas with high salt atmospheres. And you'll notice down toward the bottom under certifications, um, right now the manufacturer, EWO, of the F32 is getting a Design Lights Consortium premium listing pending. So pretty soon here, this light will be listed in the qualified products list uh, for DLC. So no heat sinks means no buildup of debris and no birds nesting on the fixture. Buildup of debris and heat sinks and heat sink fins means that uh, they'll be unable to dissipate heat like they're supposed to. The F32 doesn't have any fins, which makes it easy to clean and we can avoid buildup of debris. So here's an, uh, an overview of the LED light unit. Uh, it's made of a UV resistant PMMA. Uh, PMMA is a plexiglass AN. It's an amorphous thermoplastic molding compound. So when you remove the lens, you're left with the six multi-chip LEDs. Um, this takes 70 volts 
runs on 0 to 600 milliamps, uh, max of 42 watts. Uh, this this multi-chip is connected to the lamp housing um, to dissipate heat. Uh, so it dissipates heat through that manner rather than through heat, heat sink fins. And if we look at an exploded view, you can see the different components um, that provide the modularity, um, the maintenance benefits of the, this particular unit. There are several types of lenses that can be adapted in this unit. I'm showing two, two out of the three here. Um, the third one is a spot optic. Um, so I've left that out, but the LP lens comes in a left, all left, all right, or half left and half right, depending on where the mass is located and what area needs to be lighted. So if you're looking at a corner aircraft uh, stand on an apron, you may use an all left or all right, depending on your orientation. And then we have this LS lens, which is optimized for smaller areas, such as streets and access roads. So if you're looking to light up um, access roads at the airport as well. Um, this is a, an optic that you may consider. And here we can see um, the light output for the different LP lens options. So you can see uh, with the left or the right, you're going to get um, a, uh, a corner aircraft stand um, would be more suitable for that application. So now moving into installation. We get a lot of questions when we get into this area. Hey, what mass do you recommend? Can ADB help us design a carrier? We don't have the experience. We don't have the skills. We're not structural engineers, so this work really has to be done by an engineering firm. Recently, we have partnered with a pole manufacturer, and we were able to get some standard designs for masts and carriers based on our lights, um, which will be shown on the next slide. Thus, we can do mast installations, new mast installations, relatively easily. When it comes to retrofits, a little more work is involved in getting the existing mass and carrier information, determining if the existing carrier can support ADB's lights or if a new carrier design is needed, etc. Once all this information is collected and analyzed by an engineer, we can get a fabricator to build the required equipment for the retrofit. So we have examples and drawings of different carrier types. Uh, and we have a minimum spec for designing the carrier that describes the minimum spacing between the lights to make sure they can be tilted and angled appropriately. So here's that example drawing um, provided by Millerburn, the, the pole manufacturer that we have partnered with. So um, we had a lot of questions about uh, what's provided by the manufacturer in terms of hardware to connect the light to the carrier. So you'll see here the floodlight itself, the bracket, and we have two screws here that hold on to this connection disc. Everything from the disc to the attachment screw to the carrier and beyond it isn't provided by the lighting manufacturer. That equipment um, be thought out beforehand. So now we're getting into a, a product comparison. This table compares some typical features between the LED F32 floodlight with some of its metal halide and high pressure sodium competitors. In order to have the hot restrike feature, high pressure sodium metal halide floodlights are connected to very expensive ballast. Regarding the weight of the LED floodlight, the F32 is still heavier than traditional floodlights, but the traditional floodlights do not include any ballast or capacitors, which most of the time are installed in a cabinet at, uh, close to the mast. And then we get into uh, different LED floodlight manufacturers. Uh, we can see Cree, Hall of Fame, and Ephesus so if you look at EPA, um, as I was talking about earlier, we have the lowest um, effective projected, projected area in the market. Um, the current feed is also a significant difference from our competitors. Um, we find with the lower um, drive current, we're able to extend the longevity of the LEDs in a fixture. And especially if you're installing in a hot environment, you need to be really aware that you can't be driving the lights at 1,000 milliamps or 900 milliamps in Nevada or, <clears throat> or other hot environments. Also, efficiency is important. I've done my best to um, compare the efficiencies of these units, uh, but they're, they come in various uh, drive currents. Uh, but you can see that the efficiency of the F32 unit is much higher. Cooling fins, we're the only manufacturer that doesn't have cooling fins. Um, so that provides uh, 
increased benefits for maintenance and also uh, heat dissip dissipation. Um, also, we have a dollar control which separates us from the other LED manufacturers and this glass cover. So the benefits of having a glass cover is um, you're not building up dirt um, and fumes on the actual lenses themselves. So it's much easier to clean a flat glass cover uh, than to go into each individual fragile lens and try to clean those. So that's something um, important to consider when you're looking at floodlights. This diagram shows how to control and monitor the light itself. Everything on the right is provided by the Luminaire manufacturer and everything on the left is provided by ADB's project engineering group. You need to know what type of control you want ahead of time so the drivers can be programmed appropriately. Um, and we get some questions on what is the cost difference between 1 to 10 volt, what's the cost difference between dolly or photocell control? And the answer is there is no cost difference when it comes to the driver itself. These are programmable features um, that ADB does um, up front. And it's important to know what type of interface you want, even if you're um, not going to implement it until a later stage, maybe a few years down the road. Because after you've installed the floodlights, getting into each floodlight and reprogramming the the drivers is going to be a timely and expensive process. So this is an example of George Airport in South Africa that decided to implement wireless dolly control of the F-32 units. So this is about, this is approaching um, most advanced um, control monitoring that you can get. You can see the concentrator radio and interface for 16 relays at the bottom, which was used for control and monitoring of the F-32 units. Relays interface to the, the radio system and there is also a SCADA system with a touchscreen interface to control and monitor the lights. You can also see a GSM module um, for telecontrolling. Um, this was used for monitoring the system remotely. And what it did was send SMS messages and other things, which you don't really have to do. There are a lot of possibilities for controlling and monitoring lights, which is why it's necessary for these types of designs um, to sit down with an ADB project manager or sales manager to discuss the different available scenarios. So here showing a windage area chart for the, the F32 unit. Um, we have a lot of values listed here for the different tilting angles, but typically we see a tilt angle vary anywhere from 0 to 15 degrees. And you don't see this a lot with other uh, manufacturers. You're getting much higher tilt, tilt degrees, which gives them a, a higher um, effective projected area. So drivers, um, some customers have asked us if we can uh, install drivers remotely. Uh, typically the first point of failure for um, lighting systems that have ballasts is the ballasts which are mounted at the base um, of the pole, typically. Um, but with LED floodlights, uh, for us it, it doesn't really make sense because the whole system is rated greater than 50,000 hours. When you introduce an external remote enclosure, you're adding costs. First of all, you need to design the enclosure itself. Um, you're paying for the installation of that enclosure. And then you're, you're running four times as much cabling up to the light unit itself. So this is, these are things to take into consideration um, when deviating from the standard installation with the drivers installed inside the luminaire itself. So at Henderson Executive Airport, this is an external driver enclosure uh, that we installed. Uh, you'll, you'll notice inside this enclosure the massive amount of conductors that had to be routed up to the unit. So this is what we're trying to avoid. Now moving into uh, different design tools that are available. There are many different standards that are out there for airport service area lighting. It's important to know which standard is being used for the design basis. Both FAA and ICAO give recommendations for apron flood lighting. For ICAO, notice the requirement for a luminance value is 20 lux, and then we have a uniformity ratio of 4 to 1. We also have the clause for other apron areas stating 50% the average illuminance. So this is important to take into consideration if dimming is in the scope of the work, that we can take down from 20 lux to 10 lux. FAA AC 5360-13 tries to provide guidance for apron area lighting, but doesn't do a good job. 
The closest to the ICAO standard that we see is for pedestrian entrances to aircraft operations areas, which is 22 lux versus ICAO stated 20 lux. So IES RP37-15 was recently published, I believe it was last month, but it's being used as a guide for the planning and design of lighting systems in the airport outdoor environment. The purpose of this recommended practice for the airside is to provide for adequately lighted areas where parked aircraft are safely serviced, aircraft crew and passengers safely board and deplane, and where cargo operations are conducted. Table 1 of this document shows the recommended light levels in terms of horizontal and vertical luminance and uniformity ratio for the various lighting locations and tasks at an airport. This document is very helpful in describing the design criteria such as the different visibility concerns associated with the airport environment. So after reading through this IES RP37, it's really the, the best documentation we have out there to guide us when we're designing a lighting system outside of the airport on the air side. So this data gathering document is available on ADB's website. It's used to collect all the necessary information that we need to perform a lighting calculation. One of the important items needed during this data gathering process is an AutoCAD drawing of the apron with mass locations, heights, and areas that need to be lit. Uh, you can see an example of that AutoCAD drawing here. You can see the defined areas that need to be illuminated, uh, the position and height of the poles are noted. So we need a drawing like this before we can perform a lighting calculation. Uh, to determine, determine the LED driver current, we also use a calculator uh, that's provided by EWO, the lighting manufacturer. So this is the, uh, Dialux is the uh, software platform that we use to perform lighting calculations. You can see in this example, once we've been provided an AutoCAD drawing, we can do a, um, a pretty advanced lighting calculation. So the deliverable for the lighting calculation includes a bill of material specifying quantity, pole height, and type of F32 and optic that needs to be provided, also including drive current. And um, it also generates a false color rendering, which you can see here on the bottom. This, this was actually uh, Las Vegas Henderson Airport where we did an installation recently. And then this is an after picture. So this is that, um, this is that, that long apron. ADB also has the ability to perform an ROI analysis. Uh, a data collection document is also available um, for this on the ADB website. Uh, this is a screenshot of the tool that we use when all the information has been collected. And then uh, we have this analysis chart that we can provide that shows the total cost considering energy investment and maintenance. And what this does is compare, compare um, different options. So this blue line is a conventional light compared to an LED with no dimming, an LED with constant light output and no dimming, and an LED with constant light output and dimming. So there are different payback functions that you'll see as a result of the different options you implement. And as I mentioned earlier, we also have an available suggested specification, which is also available on our website. The specification is based on the most uh, valuable features of the F32 that provide the biggest payback. And we are now getting close to 50 airport references around the world. Um, this number is increasing very quickly. You can see back in 2011 uh, was kind of the pilot installation in Austria. So uh, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the questions dialog box. I'll wait here for a few minutes um, in case some of you are writing out some questions. Okay, I see, I see one question. The question is, I don't know if this has been mentioned in the session, but what is the light loss factor used in the lighting calculations for these fixtures? And that's a good question. We actually have gotten that question before, and it's a blocked out slide on the presentation. So let me uh, bring it up really quick. So here, here's how we calculate um, our light loss factor, maintenance factor, and then required luminous intensity and um, initial luminous intensity. So for a light that's not utilizing constant lumen output, 
we can calculate a light loss factor of 0 0.93. If we implement constant lumen output where we're varying the drive current to make sure that we're, we have the same luminous flux, uh, we use a light loss factor of 1. And the next question is, uh, can you explain constant lighting uh, you just talked about? Yes, constant lighting output. So what this does, um, and you can see um, with constant lumen output, in order to maintain the required luminous intensity of 500 lux, an initial luminous intensity of 556 lux must be installed. So what we do for constant light output or constant lumen output is program the driver to adjust the drive current on a time basis. Um, so this is done up front um, as we begin discussions with the airport uh, to define a, a curve that defines the drive current um, per period of time um, to make sure that we have constant lumen output. Okay, do we have any other questions? Copies of the slides. Yes, we will send a link. Our website will actually have a recorded um, presentation, video presentation, um, and we'll also make the, uh, a PDF of the presentation available um, to the attendees. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming, um, and we'll see you at the next webinar.